Good evening. Thank you for being here and welcome. We're excited to bring you our speaker tonight. This, my name is Liliana Lengua. I'm the director of the Center for Child and Family Wellbeing. We're a research center on campus that's really focused on promoting um, children's and families' well-being, um, primarily through supporting the social and emotional skills, mindfulness and compassion in the adults and children's lives and in youth. Um, and um, we're also committed to bringing those re that research to um, bear on practice and policy and education in the, in the community um, by having events like this, um, opportunities for all of us to um, learn throughout our lives. Also, we have um, innovative degree programs and workshops and other training opportunities. So our goal is to really bring um, meaningful evidence-based practices to practice and policy um, to benefit our children and families. Um, we're honored to have our speaker here tonight, our public lecture series. This is the third and last um, lecture in our series on resilient youth and families. And when this series, there it is, is made possible by a generous support from the Moritz Family Foundation. And I'm very thrilled to invite our or introduce our speaker tonight. Um, it's Dr. Nancy Gonzalez. She's the Foundation Professor of Psychology, Dean of Natural Sciences in the College of Arts and Liberal Science, Arts and Sciences, and co-director of the Research and Education Advancing Children's Health Institute at Arizona State University. That's where I got my PhD, and um, Nancy got her PhD here at the University of Washington, so we swapped. <laughs> Her research examines culturally informed models of family and youth resilience in low-income communities. Over the past 20 years, her work has been funded by the National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, and the Helios Education Foundation, and the Institute for Educational Science. And she's contributed, her work has contributed important insights into the cultural strengths, challenges, and positive development of Mexican Americans living in the Southwest. This research encompasses multiple collaborations and research studies that collectively span across the lifespan from birth to young adulthood. Professor Gonzalez also translates findings from culturally informed developmental studies to design and evaluate programs to reduce minor minority health disparities and promote academic resilience in secondary and post-secondary educational setting. Her team's Bridges program for middle school students demonstrate long-term effects on school engagement and achievement and prevents multiple problems up to 10 years later. And this is why we're just very excited to be here tonight and learn from her the opportunity to really share these important evidence-based practices with our community. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Nancy Gonzalez. Okay, thank you very much, Lily. Uh, in fact, when I, we were just comparing notes and we think we literally traded places. She came to UW right at the same time as I was heading back to Arizona. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, to speak with you. Um, and actually, I have, have to say, being here is a, a time for a lot of reflection for me, because it was really a wonderful um, part of my training and a wonderful foundational um, time when I first began to consider how psychology and psychological science could play a role for the greater good of society. Um, I was here at a time, it was an amazing training, time to be training here. Um, it was a time when we had really what I would call true giants in the field, um, just um, incubating, innovating, and testing a lot of therapies that have become standard practice in the field. Uh, people like Alan Marlat, who I trained with to, to work on um, controlled drum, alcohol and drug uh, abuse problems, uh, Neil Jacobson, who I worked with to understand how to work with marital therapy, John Gottman in family therapy, Jerry Dawson was here working on autism, Bob McMahon working on how do we treat behavioral disorders of youth, I'm probably forgetting a few others, but it was really a wonderful time. I um, came to truly appreciate what innovative thinking um, could be, and also um, the, the, the rigors of their work was a, was a great influence on me. I was actually also here at a time, what, another factor of uh, my training here is that at that time and still today, University of Washington had one of the strongest child clinical training programs in the country. 
Um, I was actually working with Anna Marie Kause at that time, uh, the, the current president of the, of the university now. But you know, I learned some basic principles, fundamental principles of clinical practice while I was here. The first being that evidence truly matters when we're working with our communities and that the responsibility of somebody in the role of a faculty member with the position is to make sure that we are producing um, um, programs and practices that there is evidence for that makes it worthwhile for agencies to use and to spend their resources to deliver to the public. At the same time, I also uh, really learned from these masters about the need to adapt what you do to each client. There's always this tension between fidelity and fit. You develop a standard protocol, and you have a working protocol that you have evidence for, but that's just the beginning. You now need to take that model and fit it and adapt it to the people that you're working with. They were actually masters at doing that, and, and uh, we saw them adapting programs. Actually, Marsha Linehan was here at the time also with dialectical behavior therapy and watching her tinker with that model until she got it to a point where it really fit that population. And also, the third thing that I learned from these folks was about mobilizing strengths. We have, we have a good practice to bring to, to individuals that we work with, but we always need to be looking for ways to mobilize the strengths that exist there as well so that you're creating a new pathway for them that is not just a new way of being, but it's also integrating who they are in ways that, that um, ring true for them and uh, will allow them to have a, a, a fulfilling life. So anyway, I thank the people that I work with for those valuable lessons, and uh, they now play a very big role in what I do now, but I've moved. I'm now at Arizona State University. It's a very different place. And my role there at ASU um, is uh, much more focused on different types of issues. In particular, I'm much more focused on kind of a broader look at Latino health disparities, um, where I'm more focused on the social determinants of health, prevention versus treatment, and really trying to look at the public health impact of what we understand about how to help, uh, how to help individuals family, children. Um, you know, it was a great um, privilege for me to take what I learned in return to go back to Arizona. I was actually born in Arizona, so I'm working with the Latino population, which is the community, my own community. Uh, so it's very fulfilling to do that. Um, and you know, one of the things that was true, particularly back when I was training, and I do date myself by naming all these folks, earlier because I don't think many of them are even here anymore. Um, but um, at that time, there, it was the case that a lot of the therapies that we were delivering really hadn't considered the role of culture. And they also were delivered in a way that a lot of those folks that I would be interested in working with, diverse populations, underserved populations, more disadvantaged populations, wouldn't be showing up anyway to those clinics where we were delivering those interventions. So that's what motivated me to approach things in a different way. But as I'll, I'll hopefully illustrate, I do go back to the basic principles that I learned from, from the people that I worked with when I was here. So um, let's, t let's talk a little bit about health disparities. And let me just kind of give you a framework of what I hope to do today. I'm going to meander through some information, and I'm going to sort of talk about some basic things that we've learned from working with Latino families. I'm going to present some data, but by and large, I don't think that, that folks want a data-driven uh, talk necessarily, but I can't resist throwing in some models. Um, and then I want to kind of talk about some general things that I learned and then move to some of the intervention work that we're doing, you know, trying to kind of have that impact that I talked about. So health disparities are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. Um, the thing about um, health disparities is that we know that they're primarily driven by social determinants, uh, social, environmental, and behavioral determinants. 
Um, by and large, it's not necessarily that you inherit bad genes. It has to do with things like poverty, stress, early life experiences, social exclusion, exclusion et cetera. Um, and it's not just the, ex and particularly poverty, um, accounts for 70% of the health disparities worldwide. And it's not necessarily just poverty, but it's also social inequality that helps to explain very, very uh, dramatic differences in the, in the quality of life and health in populations. And in fact, if you, this is from the World Health Organization, if you were to chart income inequality and the degree to which a country has income inequality, you have Japan on the far left and the USA way up in the corner almost off the chart. You can chart in income inequality and it, it's very directly related to um, the number of problems um, uh, that, that are related to social determinants of health. So life expectancy, infant mortality, homicides, et cetera. So it's not just being poor, but it's being poor amongst others who are advantage that carries this toll on health. Um, and, and that's part of the, the puzzle that we need to try to solve. So what do you do about health disparities? So there are options for health disparities. First of all, you can put more effort into the control of major diseases. Um, and we do a lot of that in this country. Uh, we try to control uh, you know, uh, 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 heart problems. We try to control infectious diseases. Currently, we're really trying to do something about the opioid addiction. So we try to control those problems that create um, uh, major health uh, concerns for the population. You can also try to reduce or eliminate poverty and income inequality. And there are certainly efforts to try to think about how one does that, not an easy task. But the other one is to take action on the environmental determinants of health. So there you do want to address issues of poverty, poverty, but you want to try to improve the circumstances in which people live and work. Now, morally, I think we need to be doing all three. Um, but when we're working in the domain of trying to really kind of help our families and communities, it's the kind of taking actions on social determinants where we probably have more leverage to meet the greater need if we can figure out the best way to do that. So I'm currently working in a center called the ASU REACH Institute. It used to be the Prevention Research Center. It's a center develop, um, dedicated to taking evidence-based practice and trying to uh, bring it to the broader public. Trying to address this problem that we actually know a lot about how to help children and families. We don't know everything, and there's a lot of really important questions to still be addressed, particularly as we move into models of personalized health, and we need to know not just broadly, but in more fine-tuned ways, how can we really help people. But we know a lot. We knew a lot back when I was training here at the University of Washington. Uh, you know, I don't even want to say how many years ago. Um, but the problem, and we've developed wonderful interventions, the problem is 90% of those interventions don't ever get to the community. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to deal with at the Prevention Re or at the REACH Institute. I always make that mistake. So in my work, I've been very much focused on Latino populations and uh, have had a variety of studies that have been trying to address various aspects of uh, kids and families in stress situations. So I want to just show, talk a little bit about a few of these just to make a couple of points. First of all, I want to thank my funding agencies um, and, and the, the grants that have supported this work. Um, La Familia, let's see if I have a pointer that works. I don't think I do. Okay, so the La Familia study is a longitudinal study where we have been following families from the time that their kids were in fifth grade. Those kids are now about 25, and we've been charting their development over time, and the goal of that study has been to understand broad cultural and contextual influences on development. Has been very important um, in our thinking about how we can help families. Um, then I had the Puentes study and the optimization study after that are intervention trials, all of them with Mexican-American families. La Vida Diaria is a study that I do with um, folks at UCLA, 
where we're trying to understand, use a different methodology using daily diaries to try to understand the daily lives of kids, trying to get at how their sense of family obligation, which is very important in Latino families, influences their development both in positive ways and can also kind of create unique kinds of challenges for them. Las Madres Nuevas is a study of risk and protective processes that influence postpartum depression of mother-infant um, dyads over time. Uh, we have a college knowing and going study where we're looking at sources of influence for Latino uh, 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 resilient teens who are planning to go to college. And then the Chamaco study is a study that I'm partnering with uh, some folks at UC Berkeley where we're studying the effects of early adversity in a population of migrant farm workers. So I sort of want to just, you know, it's been, it's been a wonderful opportunity to be part of these studies. Um, and just a couple of points about that. One is these studies could not have happened without a very, very close relationship with the communities that we were working with. Um, the, the Chamaco study, which I can't take credit for, it was started by Brenda Eskenazi at UC Berkeley, has basically been, um, they have a center in Salinas, uh, uh, Northern California, and it's, a, a, it's kind of a bedrock for the families in that community that have been in that study for all these years. And, uh, and all of these projects really have been developed um, with the community where they're informing our questions, but also helping us make sure we've got the right measures and being sensitive that, to that population. So, you know, that's, that's one point I really want to make clear that it's so important that that partnership is part of the work that you're doing. So just in very broad strokes, because it's certainly not possible to get into a lot of details, just want to hit some kind of highlights or main points that we've learned from the families that we've been working with. Some of them are not at all surprising. I, I know I have a sophisticated crowd here. So a lot of this will seem very familiar. So obviously, what we know is that poverty-related stress and adversity undermines the health and development of children and youth. And we know that there are very significant, severe direct effects to physical and cognitive growth from things like malnourishment, environmental exposures, and lack of a, an enriching environment, is, that, is, that, is what that should say. Um, there are also direct effects on developing youth in terms of high rates of stress, trauma, and experience of social inclusion. And there's more and more evidence that, that those experiences of acute and chronic stress um, do get under the skin in terms of having an impact not just on their social emotional development, but their biological adaptation um, and their ability to um, be re appropriately responsive to future challenges. And it's the kind of notion of the allostatic load, the kind of hammering away with stress uh, will eventually, we, if you've ever experienced burnout, you know, you know this phenomenon, you can't keep experiencing stress repeatedly. Your body has to eventually adapt and a lot of times what happens is that uh, youth will downregulate in ways or they'll become hyper aroused in ways that set them up for long-term problems. Um, so um, now these kind of early experiences, trauma, stress, social exclusion, exclusion also can trigger selective gene environment responses that increase dis disease liability. So stress and adversity has these, these very significant direct effects. But they also have indirect effects. And um, you know, certainly this is something I know Lilly Center focuses on quite a bit as well. One of the problems with stress and adversity is that it's also impacting on the families and on the family's ability to provide an optimal context for development. It's uh, just, first of all, it's disrupting access to services, healthcare. Um, it's also disrupting parenting and parents functioning. And it's limiting opportunities for youth to be cared for, socialized, and valued, and motivated. Um, and, and these experiences over time will have quite devastating effects on, can have devastating effects on kids. Um, and you know, one of the things that we find that you know, there's sort of this notion of you know, the, the bad parent, and particularly in disadvantaged communities, the parent who just doesn't care or who, who, who doesn't know how to parent. Really, if you think about those threats to the family and their abilities to cope and adapt 
physiologically, really what we're seeing is a pattern where their good intentions and their know-how is being under, undermined, and they don't quite, so they don't have the resources that they need to provide what they know is good for their kids. Um, we also have indirect effects on kids through exposures to high-risk environments in the neighborhood, peers, schools, social services, and youth-serving organizations. I know that's not news to, to, to the, the people in this crowd. Um, also, you know, we know that these kinds of effects permeate all the systems that kids interact in, and this, the sense of low social status, low participation, and lack of control, um, we find happens in all of the context in kids' schools, neighborhoods, in terms of the broader protections that the, that the uh, culture can provide, um, and um, which, you know, and, and those most vulnerable have effects, you know, kind of across systems in a way that they don't really have the safety net that they need. What this also tells us, though, is that if we're going to be designing interventions, we need to designing, be designing interventions that integrate into those very systems so that we are changing the environments that these kids are growing up in. So it's not a separate thing that we do. It's something that we need to do to actually move into whether it's the you know, nonprofit organizations or media or um, schools, et cetera. So, OK. So poverty-related stressors also have this negative or cascading effect over time. Early adversity is particularly detrimental because it sets kids up for, the, for early kind of physiological um, adaptation um, and regulatory problems. But then those effects can snowball over time as kids then face yet another environment that isn't quite up to providing that optimal care. Um, there are particular populations that are most vulnerable, immigrant youth, refugees, um, foster youth, for example. Um, and there are key turning points or transitions um, also are very important and can provide important opportunities for intervention. So um, you'll see a lot of interventions designed around things like I think Lily's group is doing the transition to, to parenthood, so new moms, new transition, Great opportunity to prevent to um, prevent some early risk. Then there's transition to elementary school. Another opportunity. It's another potential risk for snowball, right? You have a kid who has had some struggles early on in terms of their ability to manage their behavior. They put them into the school system. The school system's not ready to respond. And then you could have your first very significant kind of snowball effect. Likewise, transition into middle school is another key point. Transition into college, transition into adulthood. So oftentimes, you'll see um, a lot of interventions focused on those key transition points. It's for a really good reason, um, both to prevent the downslide, but also it's, it's a time for um, where you can really see important changes um, to, to reverse some trajectories. So just, you know, here's a model to throw in some data of, uh, this is from the La Familia project, you know, where you see on the left-hand side, we're charting uh, in elementary school kids who have high levels of family risk and peer social rejection will be at greater risk, which I had a little thing, for um, externalizing and internalizing problems when they get into middle school. Um, then those kids will be at greater risk when they get into high school for channeling, being more vulnerable to deviant peers. And then those kids over time are going to be at greater risk for getting into problems with alcohol use and um, high risk sexual behavior. So, yeah. So these are kind of models that we've been charting to try to understand which path. Here we go. There we are. This one. The green one. The green one. Thank you. OK. So anyway, these are just examples of some long-term effects that we're showing. One thing I want to do want to point out here is a lot of times people think that it's this early externalizing and internalizing problems that are going to uh, that set you up for long-term risk. But what we're finding is that if you have high levels of family risk, and you know, especially if it's combined with social rejection, even if you didn't have early problems in middle school 
you're still vulnerable to this sort of deviant peer culture when you get into high school. Um, okay. So, so I've set up a lot of, these are the risks. A lot of what I've talked about is not that different than what we see in the general population. Uh, these are kind of models of, that we see in developmental psychopathology quite a bit. So, but despite these risks, we do find significant evidence of resilience in the, in the Latino population, of uh, kids and families who are defying the odds. And so a big question that we've been asking ourselves is, so what predicts resilience in the Latino community? Um, and so that's what I want to talk a little bit about next. You know, some key examples of, of, um, of defying the odds, you've probably heard of the notion of the immigrant paradox. The idea that, you know, I've just talked about um, low socioeconomic status, immigrant status being a high risk because it's going to set you up without this safety net, lack of connection to social services, et cetera. Um, but it turns out that immigrant kids actually fare better on many risks. And so the question is, why would that be the case? Um, so there are a couple of things that we've been focused on. Pushing the wrong thing. So one of the things that we know quite clearly is that if families are able to maintain their strengths despite their exposure to risks, those families are going to do much better. Um, families who are able to maintain strong bonds are able to provide effective monitoring of their youth or avail uh, are able to be available to their youth. Um, those kids are going to do much better. Again, not too much different than mainstream populations, but a very key part of what we do it, it, when we develop interventions. And it's not... Um, you know, it's not rocket science. I can say that because I'm, I'm now the, uh, I, I cover the school in Earth, of Earth and Space Exploration, and I do know what rocket science is, but it's just as important and just as powerful an influence. And it's something that we know works, and uh, it, it's kind of a, a public service that we can do. So maintaining family strengths, but also maintaining cultural strengths, and that cultural ties to your family and your community turns out to be a very, very important protective factor for Latino families. And we see this in all of the studies that I presented. We see this in a variety of ways. And it's actually um, the, the combination of the two tends to account for a lot of the differences in terms, accounts for a lot of what we see in terms of the immigrant paradox and uh, patterns of resilience. Um, so, Here's just, this is from a study, a qualitative study that we did where we were interviewing kids about the resilient kids. You know, what is it about, um, what, what motivated you, despite the fact that you are in low-income schools, actually some of the kids that we uh, interviewed were living right at the border and would actually cross the border every day to go to school and then go back across the border. What motivates you to go to school? And time and time again we hear it's the family and this sense of obligation, uh, this sense to achieve um, for the sake of their family, families who sacrifice for them, um, families who, uh, this the sense that we want to do well for ourselves and our families uh, to help parents um, uh, in terms of give them what they missed out on. And we hear this from the parent as well. And in fact, um, we get a lot of uh, pushback about the uh, immigrant uh, population in the state of Arizona and the, the problem of the immigrants in the schools. And a lot of the narrative is that those families just don't care. But in fact, that's the main reason many of them have immigrated in, here in the first place. And you hear it in their narratives. You hear it in the kids. And the kids are who are doing well. They have incorporated this sense that it's all about the family and, and, and making the family proud. Um, we also find that this strong sense of cultural identity is a very important protective factor in terms of counteracting the, the effects of discrimination, negative stereotypes and discrimination. So the kind of, the, the, the threats that come from living in an environment of social exclusion and discrimination. Um, and the kids uh, talk about the fact that people see us in a certain way, but that makes us want to fight back. That makes us want to do better and they want to counteract um, discrimination. Uh, 
and, in, and we find that they derive that sense of wanting to fight back, not just from their families, but also from their communities, the sense that my community believes in me, I want to do it for my community. And we've done a lot of research. I talked about the La Familia study where we, we were really trying to understand cultural and community influences. It was a study where we um, interviewed families. We selected families from 43 different communities across the state because we really wanted to get diversity in terms of the percentage of Latinos in their schools and in their neighborhoods, and we really wanted to understand what is it about the um, neighborhood culture that has an influence. And what we find is this: there's this ethnic enclave protective factor. Now, earlier I said living in disadvantage is a risk factor, but for, in our study anyway, living in an ethnic enclave, which are the poorest neighborhoods of all, actually ends up being protective, and those kids have um, lower rates of problems when they're living in that protective environment. So there's something quite powerful about that community. Um, Rebecca White is a, a um, collaborator who's done a lot of that work. Um, Katie Burkell also has done some work where she's looking at doing the daily diary approach and collecting cortisol to kind of look at stress levels and finding that if you live in an ethnic enclave, uh, your, your kind of exposure to stress and your daily uh, cortisol levels are not elevated in the same way. And also that um, when, and when we get reports of experiences of discrimination, that seems to be explaining part of it is that you're not kind of on a daily basis. You've got a safe haven to go home to. Um, and you've got that protectiveness of the culture who can buoy you back up. And so for those of us who study stress processes, you know, it's, you know we, we experience stress, and part of the problem of chronic stress is that there's never a recovery. You need to be able to experience it. You know, your, your, your uh, adrenaline, your cortisol levels peak, but then you need a way to kind of come back down from that and recover, and these ethnic communities are seeming to be playing an important role for, for our kids. So I just want to uh, present a little bit more data here. This is a study where you can see that the effects of discrimination have um, you know, these predictive paths to more internalizing, which is depression, basically, depression and anxiety, higher, le lower levels of academic self-efficacy, so it's impairing their sense of efficacy in school. And um, there used to be a path to externalizing. I think there should be. I must have a, oh no, I know what I'm doing. So we find, um, Discrimination has these negative effects over time, lower grades. Um, we were very interested to see whether or not maintenance of traditional values, which is something we've been focusing on a lot, would have an impact. And what we find is that adolescent discrimination, earlier I talked about um, sometimes kids can respond to discrimination by pushing back and sort of reaffirming their culture. And we actually find a positive relationship. The higher levels of discrimination actually prompt you to turn to your community, to turn to your values as, and as a source of stress. And when that happens, adolescent traditional values have this compensatory effect on both on internalizing academic self-efficacy and externalizing. So if you have this protective mechanism, this way of coping, through identification with your culture, it can offset some of the negative effects of experiences of discrimination. So in my kind of focusing on culture and cultural adaptation and cultural values, I've been very interested in the notion of bicultural adaptation and the fact that you know, we so often talk about our kids adjusting to the US culture are they becoming more Americanized? There's lots of debate on that, you know, with some people thinking they should become more Americanized, they shouldn't continue to speak their, their heritage language. So, but we've been really much, very much focused on the fact that even though you are identifying with your, you know, you can have, um, you know, identify with US culture to a higher or lower degree, you're simultaneously also identifying with your traditional culture to a higher or lower level of degree. Barry's model of adaptation suggests that you know, there's really different patterns of adapting. 
The assimilation model is you do become much more Americanized. You become uh, less attached to your own culture and more attached to the US culture. Separation is a model where you become, uh, you don't acculturate and you just stay um, identified with your Mexican culture. Marginalization is the pattern of where you actually don't connect to either culture. And then bicultural is where you have high levels of attachment to both culture. There's been a lot of debate about whether or not kids should assimilate or we should try to encourage kids to become bicultural. Um, and over the years, you know, there's increasing evidence that the bicultural adaptation pattern is much more adaptive in many ways. Um, uh, you know, even bilingualism seems to have positive effects on cognitive development. Um, it allows you the ability to pull different coping strategies from both cultures. Uh, it gives you ability to navigate across contexts. Um, and we're finding that to be very true across our studies. And in fact, we did a study where we um, wanted to see whether or not biculturalism would have an, or, or these patterns of cultural adaptation would have an impact on stress reactivity. So the hypothesis that, you know, if you're more bicultural, does that give you an adaptive advantage? So uh, we did a study with the Chamacos kids that we, in, in Salinas Valley, California, who have been studied over time. And we, uh, at age 14, they completed a trio social stress test. So we bring them into the lab. We put them through a standard st stress task. Some of you may be familiar with this. And then you, um, you collect cortisol to be able to chart how they're reacting to this challenge. So earlier, I talked about how exposure to stress can, um, can, can deplete your resources and your ability to mount a challenge to stress. Well, this stress test. And the way it typically works is you bring them into a lab setting and you uh, give them a task to give a speech. Like, and everybody giving a speech, your, your cortisol elevates um, because you're, you, know, you're, you know that there's you know, a lot at stake and you need to do well. And so you're mounting a challenge so your cortisol will increase. Um, and hopefully, uh, if you have abilities to cope through the process, you'll see an increase, but over time, a return to baseline. Um, the, the hypothesis is that kids who have been exposed to high levels of stress without good coping mechanisms um, may either elevate too much or they may develop a blunted pattern. So we wanted to test that um, and, uh, using this model. So we did that task. And what we found is actually really striking differences in your response to that laboratory experimental task as a function of whether you were bicultural or whether you were monocultural Mexican orientation or monocultural Anglo orientation. So the way that looked is it turns out that if you were bicultural, you saw this um, kind of what would be the typical stress response. You're in the stress challenge, and, and this is charting cortisol over time. Your cortisol, everybody starts here at baseline. You know, 15 minutes later, we're getting your cortisol again. Your stress peaks, but then you return to baseline. We find that the Mexican-oriented kids, the more Mexican-oriented and, and not really acculturated, mounted a bit of a stress response. But those who were just high angle orientation show this blunted response. So now there's always um, interpretation issues with these kinds of studies, because it could also be that this pattern is, is you know, uh, highly stress reactive, um, and that could be a problem. But this was kind of a, kind of an initial test of whether or not we see biological effects that are attached to this cultural orientation. We, and, and we did some other kind of sensitivity analyses to sort of see, well, what else would predict this stress response? And we looked at family conflict. So family conflict is one of those things that if, if is associated with kind of more maladaptive responding. And, and, and we do find that high levels of conflict predicted this blunted response. So it did sort of give us more confidence that what we're seeing here is a more adaptive ability to respond to stress, to mount an appropriate response to a challenge in those kids who identified as bicultural. 
Okay, so maintenance of cultural strengths and success in mainstream society, we strongly believe are both necessary to reduce health disparities, an important part of the puzzle when working with Latino families. I also wanna kind of switch gears a little bit and also just put out there that I also think that reducing educational disparities is another important piece of how we reduce health disparities. In reducing educational disparity, uh, disparities, increasing college enrollment and college degree attainment. Um, you know, so much of what we saw had to do with income inequality and um, that, so solving the puzzle of more of these kids having more advantages so they can integrate in a successful way into mainstream society, I think is, is a very important goal. Um, and you know, there are uh, sig uh, significant gaps, attainment gaps between Hispanics and the overall population in terms of uh, college degree attainment. The other thing that we find so, is that we see kids' enrollment in school is pretty equal, but starts to diverge kind of about in middle school. Um, peaking kind of in the high school years um, and kind of further widening over time. But, you know, uh, it, 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 it's more equal because people are out of school. But we do start to see that pattern of decreasing enrollment in school taking place in the adolescent period. And the differences in high school completion cause a 20% point disparity in bachelor's degree attainment by age 25. So overall, this, these are national numbers, Hispanics versus non-Hispanics. And that in, uh, leads to rising income inequality um, with significant difference in earning potential and earnings between Hispanics and non-Hispanics over time. So if we want to address poverty and income inequality, We've been very focused on education as a, a key part of how we do that for the Latino population. So I'll switch a little bit. And can I see where we are for time? Oh, oh, thank you. So I want to just switch a little bit now and talk. So, so what are some things that we've been doing about that? So you know, um, we have been trying to form educational partners for what we call knowledge transfer is. We've got all this information about how to help families. We know what the problems are. How do we try to um, work with educational partners to make a difference? Um, so I'll talk a little bit about, I'll probably just get to talk about maybe the Bridges program, which is one we've been working on quite a bit. The Bridges program is a middle school promotion and prevention program. We focus on middle school transition as a key turning point. Earlier I said transition. It is important. What we do is we have parents and teens attend highly interactive sessions with trained leaders. We support college going pathways and identity development. We strengthen social capital and social networks, really try to bring the families and kids into the school and have them feel that they're partners with the school. We build individual and family competencies for resilience, strengthen family bonds and cultural identity and we leverage positive influence of peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. We also have started working with the schools to adopt more inclusive practices, and we've made it a requirement of the school that if you want our program to come into the school, you have to be willing to also make changes in, in school practices so that it is a more welcoming place and that you really are true partners with these families in the schools. Um, and you know, one thing you'll, you'll see here, I, I know there are questions about cultural adaptation and what's the right approach. You, you'll see that our model is very much building cultural strengths, building what's there. At the same time, it's very much a, an acculturation model. It's you know, success in US mainstream education systems and institutions is also part of the goal. It's also a goal that the families buy into. That's why they came here in the first place. They, they want their kids to succeed in school. So the Bridges program, um, the way we talk about it is that it promotes uh, future selves, middle school engagement, and positive youth development. So it's very much a kind of kids sort of charting their, their path to the future. And it prevents emotional, behavioral, and substance use problems. So it's a promotion program but it also, by promoting resilience and strength, it prevents, these prob it prevents problems at the same time. 
Um, I want to talk just a little bit about future positive sel possible selves. We use a model out of social psychology, the future possible selves notion, um, which is, allows kids to formulate. We help kids kind of think about the, their goals for the future, images of the future. We help them articulate them over time as, so that they can um, formulate an identity of themselves as somebody who wants to succeed in school, can succeed in school, and has a pathway to, to college attainment. So why focus on possible selves? We know that individuals who do not have vivid future possible selves, who can't see themselves in the future in, in positive ways, have difficulty envisioning a future with a college degree. They will prefer, prefer immediate awards, rewards over more distant ones. Um, a process called temporal discounting. So am I going to study? No, I'd rather just go play because that's more immediately gratifying. When you get into high school and college, am I going to focus on um, work in school or am I going to go out partying with my friends? Um, we know that um, that sense of the future possibilities is in part what motivates kids. We also know that they're more vulnerable and less likely per to persist with academic challenges, so kids who don't have a vivid, po vivid possible selves in the future are more likely to give up when they get that bad grade in, in their class and they'll just decide, well, it's not for me, rather than persist. Uh, uh, possible selves are particularly important for underrepresented minority, minorities, women in STEM, first generation college students from low income families. So we focus a lot on possible selves in the program. We promote possible selves and school engagement. We increase youth skills to navigate middle school transition. And we t teach a variety of coping skills. So we're trying to give them those coping mechanisms to be able to manage stress in their life. Focus a lot of, on peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and collaboration to kind of help each other, egg each other on to, to um, be working toward their goals together. So uh, we've actually used of, uh, scenarios to help kids kind of think through what they're going to do. And we have done, uh, we're using a lot of animation. So we have animated videos that they kind of can discuss together. You'll notice the animated videos are blobs. And <laughs> some people say they think of, they look like pickles. They're multiple <laughs> colors. Um, you can tell they're you know, middle school age kids. So this was done intentionally as our way to kind of deal with two things. One is the kind of the, the cultural compatibility of the program. Although we're working with Mexican Americans, initially we've now moved into multi-ethnic schools. Am I getting two? But it also uh, gets over the problem that when you do videos with kids that you're trying to portray the kids in 2018, that by 2020, that just looks terrible. And the kids won't pay attention to the video anymore because they're making fun of that kid's hair. Can you believe that? You know, that's so, you know, uh, you know, so yesterday. So that was why we went with these animated videos. They kind of like them. So in a nutshell, the program is imagine your future, be smart about pursuing your goals, and be bold. And that's about a variety of coping skills that we teach that are a variety of kind of acceptance strategies are along with some cognitive behavioral strategies. For the parent intervention, we're strengthening parenting and parent-teen communication. We're increasing parental involvement and social capital. And we're leveraging family and cultural strengths. Um, we teach, we call them for skill sets, connect, watch, limit, and focus. The focus piece uh, is a mindfulness piece. Um, and we really are sort of doing mindfulness in the service of being able to be the kind of parent that you want to be. And we work a lot with parents in having them kind of decide what the value system is for themselves and their family um, in, in, in making choices about how the program fits them. So we offer the parent in English and Spanish. I'm off again. For the parents, we do filmed videos also. Um, again, we filmed them in white screen because we didn't want people to look at the furniture and say that furniture is, you know, looks terrible or, you know, that that's not a low income family's house or that's, you know, et cetera. So we try to make it as blank as possible because we're really trying to focus on the point of the of the skill that we're teaching. 
We use a lot of peer-to-peer, parent-to-parent, and, and we do family sessions as well. So the power of the program, we evaluated the program in a randomized trial and uh, saw in seventh grade, and then we followed the kids to eighth, ninth, twelfth, and then age 20. We found reduced parenting conflict, improved family relationships, stronger parenting skills, and less distress for parents. We actually had lower levels of depression in the, in the moms who did the program. And then for teens, we saw improved grades and school motivation, fewer discipline and emotional problems in middle and high school, higher rates of high school graduation. We were very happy about that one. Lower rates of drug and alcohol use in middle and high school, and fewer substance use disorders as young adults. Um, we demonstrated lasting effects. Uh, we increased and, and uh, we significantly in, in, uh, increased school engagement into high school and uh, better articulated possible selves. And we also found that school engagement in high school was an important mediator on later depression and anxiety as well as problem substance use. And then long-term effects demonstrated the importance of school bonding. So, I want to just say a little bit about mediation. In all of the aspects of the program that we were trying to change, we carefully um, measure them over time so that we can do analyses to kind of figure out what is it about the program that worked. So mediation analyses have been very important for us, and that becomes important as we think about next steps. So here are just some findings with uh, our drug abuse outcomes. What we find are treatment by baseline effects. So in other words, now this is not working. So in other words, we find that the program uh, had effects on alcohol use, binge drinking, and drunkenness that were moderated by whether or not the kid in seventh grade had already started using. And so kids who were already early users in seventh grade ended up showing the strongest effects over time. Uh, same for alcohol use disorders. Uh, we found an effect uh, treatment by baseline by language effect there. So as I said, we did the program in English and Spanish. We get stronger effects for higher risk kids because they started initiating early, but we also find that the effects are stronger for the uh, kids who did it in English, which turn out to be the higher risk kids also. Okay, so now what we're trying to do is optimize the program for dissemination and population impact. So we've, and, and we've really been thinking hard about this problem that programs don't ever, oops, don't ever get to the community. Um, so one thing we've been focusing on is streamlining the program. It was initially 11 sessions and we streamlined it down to four. And the way we did that was by doing those careful mediation analyses, letting our data tell us the parts that really weren't having an impact and redesigning uh, because we were finding, and we've got nice uh, growth models that we do that show us that a lot of families drop out after the fourth session. And so we said, okay, we've got them for four. If that's the reality, then let's design for the reality and try to roll it all into four. So we're doing a big trial of that program right now. Um, we've also been adapting it to new contexts and sort of letting the, our community decide how do you want to, how would you deliver this program? So uh, we have somebody running parent cafes in Mexico where they green, bring groups of moms together and they kind of sit around and have coffee and they talk about things and it's a very relaxed kind of group. It doesn't look anything like when we run it in our lab when we've got our cameras on them and you know we're monitoring everything they do. It's a very relaxed cafe setting that it runs very well. Um, we've got an, a parent advocate model that's developed in Nicaragua where we had a group of uh, interventionists who were trained to deliver the program. They said to us about the mindfulness, we were talking about this earlier, that's never gonna fly here. That's just weird. And then when they tried it, they loved it. And, <laughs> yay! Um, and what has happened there is a bunch of mothers who did the program want to now run the program. And so we're rolling it out across Nicaragua where the, the graduates of the program are now being trained to deliver the program. 
Um, we're also working a lot on alternative delivery models through technology and really, again, riding the wave of reality, which is that people get their information in different ways now. People are busy. They don't necessarily want to attend groups, so we're playing around with some developing some apps um, to, to, to deliver the program. So I'm not, I won't be, I'm going to just mention a few other things that we're doing with education partners to give you a, a, a sense of, of, of kind of the ways that we're thinking about things. Just I want to mention one program that we're developing for kids with indicated anxiety. So they're showing anxiety levels that are not quite diagnosed anxiety problems yet, but they're problematic, which is a, a big problem for Latino kids in our schools. Um, and we developed this program called Compass for Courage. Also a streamlined program, anxiety interventions are often, you know, 16 to, uh, you know, 30 whatever sessions. And we've turned this program, and this is our Armando Pina's work at ASU, into, um, uh, oops, where's my one slide? Oh, I had a really nice slide. Where'd it go? Anyway. My box slide is, we've turned the program into a model that can be delivered by school personnel, um, and it's, a, it's all a game. So they get, and so it, it streamlines the program down to six sessions, but it also is easy to administer because the whole, all the teaching occurs in the context of a game. So there's a guidebook, student handouts, we teach things about physiological reactions to stress. We teach about emotions. We have this worry heads game where kids sort of, you know, they have cards that they pull and they're learning and practicing their skills around, cog or around cognitive aspects of anxiety, around communication skills, assertiveness skills, exposures. Um, so, uh, and we also have developed some apps, uh, or Armando's developing some uh, apps that allow you to do home practice. So when you streamline a program down to only six, one problem is dosage. How, you gotta get them enough practice so that they're actually getting benefit from the program. So the app allows them to do that. And so we're, we're trying to really play with how do we take evidence-based practice. There's really good evidence about how to treat anxiety disorders in kids, but so many of those programs are not getting out to the school. So um, this program actually has been widely adopted um, at, by schools in Arizona as well as elsewhere. So I think I'm going to stop there to allow questions. We have... so. I'll just mention that I've got some colleagues developing a, a program for uh, to develop possible selves and vividness of possible selves for uh, um, minority kids in college STEM classes using that same principle of vividness of uh, and um, kind of using various strategies to do that. I've got um, also uh, 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 colleagues who are trying to use what we know about how family engagement and the role of Mexican American parents is so important for school success and developed an intervention that we work with the incoming freshmen uh, before they, they come to college. And it's a family-based intervention to try to provide, oops, that's part of my slide missing there, um, to provide uh, uh, help for parents, they go online, they do an online class, we've got some texts that we send them, text messages about how you can be responding to your kid, recognizing opportunities to provide support to not just support their success in college, but also to help them with things like problem drinking when they recognize it. So that's what we're doing with our school partners. I just want to close by saying, so coming back to my original fundamental lessons, Evidence really does matter. It matters because it allows you to know that you're on track and you're, what you have is going to have an impact, but that's just step one. You then need to adapt to your client, like I said before, but the client here is not just the person in front of you. It's the families you work with, your communities, the service settings, the institutions that you work with, and you have to be willing to take 
those core components, the effective ingredients of your programs and adapt them to those settings as well. And then always mobilize strengths. And we found that that's been a core piece of our program in working with Mexican American families. Are we doing something radically different when we t train Mexican American parents to monitor their kids? No, not really. Are we doing something really different when we teach them how to communicate well and listen well? No, we're not, but we're embedding it within a sense of you have your own family strengths that you bring to this, and that's equally important for your child's development. So it's kind of the combination, which really is bicultural adaptation uh, that, that we think uh, kind of defines a lot of what we're doing. So I'll stop there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that is a really um, difficult problem. I mean, it's it, it it it's interesting to think about in terms of what it is that kids need. I think if if they, yeah, I mean, they fundamentally need some sense of stability. Um, number one, and so visioning the future when your, 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 your sense of stability is so shaky, it, it's hard to imagine that leap. Um, but I suppose you could Im make sure that they are in a protective environment where they do have supportive adults who can help them think about this period in their life as a temporary period and kind of envisioning how they, you know, envisioning the future of being successful and connected with family. Um, and, you know, and, you know, the, the importance of, of trying to do well for the sake of the family as well. I mean, it's a stretch. But I do think sort of working with them kind of on a one-on-one -on -one basis around what is the narrative that they're creating about their future in this context and, and probably a lot of support and, and, and coping skills and just sort of stress management and, and you know, trauma-focused kind of work is, is what's needed. It's probably a, a combination, but that, that's a difficult one. Yeah. I just wanted to add, I'm the mental health therapist um, at the Seattle. Okay. So, so I'm on a grant that targets middle school. Okay. So part of it is intervention for those students. To, again, just provide successes for them, provide those supports for them, um, resources, um, you know, collaborating with families, just to you know help them navigate you know mainstream culture. So mm -hmm. that's part of the grant that we're doing. Um, we're doing intervention through expert and then providing that intervention. Yeah. Groups or individual counseling. So, so there are there are some resources for those kids. Yeah. Um, for middle and high school. That's that's great. I mean, that that sounds like a, a really good approach. Um, yeah. Good. Congratulations. For, I mean, thank you for doing that kind of work. That's so important. Yeah. There was a question over here. Did you, did you have your question? Um, I have one. When you were talking about um, kind of streamlining things, and, and I'm just curious. You know, you have mentioned the value in meeting in person or having community, and then as it, things get scaled down or into then uh, into an app form, how do you kind of balance that? Yeah, we were talking about that just today, and I what I would say is that I think there's always a place for that in-person version of the program. And I think there are, and because there are so many benefits beyond just 
the content of what you're getting. You're interacting with others, you're learning from others, and in fact, we structure the program very much in, rather than just telling them what to do, we invite other people to kind of share, and they really learn from each other. So you would have to figure out, how do I, how do I replicate that? Uh, there's also the coaching that you get from the, inter the person that you're working with, who, you know, you try things out, you come back, and you get a lot of coaching around that. I, I think um, we haven't figured that out yet. I think thinking creatively, though, there are a lot more people who belong to groups that are not in-person groups. So there might be a way to structure social, social mediated kinds of interventions where they get parts of the program and they can still check in with connected social groups to do that. And I know there are some people who are doing, you know, groups that are, you know, of people from all over the country. Uh, who kind of dial in and, and share in that way. So it could be th done in that way, but I also think that so much of what we teach is valuable, and so it's kind of up to us to figure out various ways to get it out there. And some families just are simply never gonna cross that threshold, so if we can reach them this way, then that would be great. I mean, my, my what I would love to be able to do is to turn these into kind of YouTube videos with practice that you could have an app that you do your practice on with an app and have that be something that schools invite all of their middle school parents to do because it's not just relevant to, you know, the, the Title I schools I work with or Mexican Americans. It's really relevant to all parents who can use that extra expertise that we all have about how to keep their kids on the path that they want. We have cohorts that do the program together, okay. yeah. And, and do you find that those cohorts do tend to stick together in terms of social groupings, or do they kind of? Not, not the kids. Okay. And in fact, it's kind of, it's, you know, we recruit the kids in, you know, it's so much is parent driven. You're going to come because your parent wants to come. And so a lot of times the kids will end up in groups with other kids that they don't know or other kids that they would never actually right. mm -hmm. yeah. hang out That's with. Yes, but, and that we like that. There's a sort of sense of I'm not here just, you know, in my standard mode uh, trying to show off for my friend. I'm here with a bunch of people experiencing this new, you know, experience together. We like, we sort of think that that works better that way. Yeah. Kind of a nerdy researcher question. Um, I heard you talk about a lot of different methodological approaches, daily diaries, mm -hmm. um, biological measures of stress, um, laboratory um, tests, and so I'm just curious if you have, you know, a favorite method, um, especially if you're working with Latino populations or something. If you could put it in every study, you would. Or oh gosh. <laughs> um. they all just answered different questions. So I would just, and that's, I mean, what, that's what's fun about being a faculty member is you get to do different questions and you know, ask different questions in different ways and have different collaborators who bring a different twist to what you're doing. So I think, I don't think I could answer that. Um, You know, I, I really do like the daily diary approach because I sort of think that we're getting at some things, especially around stress and coping, and uh, that that we, we can't quite get at with the other longitudinal designs, it's certainly not the cross-sectional. So I do like that approach, but it has its limitations as well. So I don't know, do you have a favorite? <laughs> yeah. My guess is that you've tried it all, and so you know, yeah. maybe other things that you wouldn't do again. <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing that didn't work for us, it, it, but it, it's very confounded, is we tried to collect um, uh, uh, saliva for genetic data. But we started this project right as the election was happening. 
and we could not get anybody to come back into the lab and give us their saliva. And so, so maybe it was, you know, we probably, it was a timing effect. It was also the case that our kids at that age were in their 20s, and it was really hard to track them down and to get them into the lab. Or we would drive out in our cars to get the saliva. It was just really hard to do. So we actually switched, because we're still following those kids, and we, we gave up on that, and we're doing it all online all online survey measures, because uh, we couldn't get them back in. Mm -hmm. I want to ask a nerdy question, too. Um, do you have any measures of resilience that you have found, um, in Spanish, that you have found um, have had good results uh, and have been meaningful to the families and the adults you're working with? You know, I don't think, um, I would say no because I don't, I think of resilience more, less as a measure and more as um, kind of a process. So it kind of a, a response to being in adversity and so then positive outcomes in response. So I, I, so I haven't tried to measure. We measure things like competence, um, but we measure, so we measure both um, positive development and we measure, you know, problem outcomes and really try to see whether or not, you know, some of what we think are resilience factors are helping to account for some of those different pathways. But we haven't been measuring resilience specifically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask another question? Yes. Yes. Um, my question was, I know that you touched just a little bit regarding, like, the partnerships that the program has had with certain schools and having to change or in order for the schools to get that program into the school, they kind of had to do a shift or a change in some type of form. And I just wanted to know what were those changes that those schools needed to make in order to adopt this program? Yeah, that we requ we required them to, or we, you know, we sort of do this um, assessment around their readiness for change. Um, and it has to do with whether or not they're willing to support the program and its implementation in terms of all the different things that we're asking to do, um, whether or not they're willing to um, deliver the program with their own personnel. So it's not the case that we're going to bring in our people from the outside, which is how we did the initial trial, but that they need to identify people in their school setting. Now, sometimes it, it's mostly been somebody in their school setting. It's been teachers a lot, actually, because um, um, and, um, and some schools will contract out to outside agencies because that's how they do it, but they need to be the one to contract rather than having us bring our people in. Um, and they need to be willing to comply with uh, uh, the training schedule and fidelity check. So we require all of their interventionists to be videotaped and we need them to kind of meet certain standards of delivering it well for us to say, you know, yes, you're, you're um, you know, you're, it's the model. Um, and then we, we uh, want them to have to kind of start discussions in their school about ways that they can improve their practices around inclusion with the families that they're working with. Um, and that's sort of just a little bit beginning, you know, things like do you have Spanish speaking services in the schools and who are those people and have those, are those people willing to be trained in some of the principles that we teach in the program? Um, there's, uh, you know, I, I think more could be done there in terms of training kind of around, you know, cultural sensitivity with school staff, which is something that we want to try to do. But we want some level of commitment that we're not just kind of dropping in with our resources and doing it, but they are willing to think about this as a change in cultural practice for them. Yeah, so, uh, and we do find that, and I think there, what we're doing and um, is trying to, I think about this with more of the college sample, that we're trying to have them 
be able to articulate a future for themselves in which they can have their own pathway of personal success while also staying engaged with the family so that they don't just see that always as incompatible. Um, and, um, and kind of remembering the way in which that can serve the family and that that's also the family goal. We also work with the parent around um, helping them also understand how they can support the kid. And th that's one part of the program I didn't touch on as much as, you know, we've got the, the sessions for the kids and the sessions for the parents, but they're very linked up. And so when we teach about, you know, future possible cells for the kids, the kids then come together with their parent at the end of that session and they share some of that with their parent. And then their parent can listen and try to understand and encourage. We talk with parents about um, opportunities that they can help their kids um, seek out to kind of promote their own development um, and also kind of the struggles that kids can have. Uh, try to help the family navigate the fact that we know some of those kids have to work to help their families. We know some of those kids have to do the child care. And so it's not, a, it's not a black or white. It's like how do you still maintain your own pathway even though you have these other things. And, and, and it's, it's, if you think about it, it's a, it's a problem solving kind of exercise. OK, I, how, how am I going to deal with this? And we have a video. I, one of our videos is, is very much that, a girl sort of feeling like she wants to go do some kind of opportunity that's related to her career aspiration, but um, she's got to take care of her brothers and sisters, and she can't take advantage of this opportunity. And so we very much have it a discussion so kids know this is a real issue. And so they understand it's not just me facing this issue, but it doesn't mean I have to give up a pathway. It just means it's going to be harder. Last question. Oh. Uh, does the REACH program integrates uh, research from the rapidly expanding field of ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences? Um, we, we haven't been, but we're actually starting a new partner with Phoenix Children's Hospital that will be doing that. And we've got a colleague who has been trying to adapt um, family evidence-based practice to primary care settings, and so we hope to be going in that direction. That yeah. Well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Oh, oh, oh. One more. <laughs> oh, up there? Up there. Uh, I kind of want to go off of what you were saying, that um, um, going back to that quadrant where you had the example of how um, being bicultural has the greatest benefit rather than being monocultural towards just your Latino background versus just the youth American background. But um, kind of like how, how do you work with um, like families that isn't supportive of your goals and aspirations? How do you um, approach what is the, the non-Latino community Yeah, I mean, I would say that there are, we sort of, we present those as challenge, challenges to be navigated and give, equip kids and families with skills to be able to navigate. But there are other programs that try to take that head on. And you know, there's a whole wave of research um, building on some of Cohen's work at Stanford around values affir affirmation, in the sense of the, to the, that in fact, if you're in environments that kind of don't see you or are, d discriminate against you and exclude you and don't see you as part of, of uh, you know, that group, that your ability to affirm who you are in those contexts can actually be very adaptive. So a lot of people are moving into kind of identity development interventions as one way to combat that, that the sense of exclusion. And it ties to what I was talking about is the more you can affirm your own, here's who I am, um, that allows you to, uh, you know, uh, 
kind of persist despite the discrimination. There are also people who very directly have interventions focused on that kind of the struggles of the, bi the biculturalism with, for families who don't want their kids to acculturate, and really sort of trying to help them understand how, to, how um, their kids' acculturation doesn't necessarily have to be threatening and a sense of separation. I would say we don't tackle that on exactly, but there are other people trying to do those sorts of things. Okay, we'll stand up here for a couple minutes to take any last questions that you didn't get to ask. But again, help me thank um, Dr. Thank you.